Make up mine. Let's not mince words here. Medics are hard to come by in casual TF2. While most players might agree he's inarguably the most important class in the game for a team to have, most players in casual really don't want to bite the bullet and pick him. They'd rather be the fourth scout or the third spy on their team than the first medic. Because of this, TF2 actually does feature a few weapons that allow non-healing classes to fill medic's role. Weapons that offer on-command support and self-sustain for classes who otherwise don't specialize in it. In this video, I want to talk about some of these weapons. I find them pretty interesting, as they pretty much exist entirely to cover the relative rarity of medics in casual. That said, I also want to stress what we're actually going to be talking about in this video. There are a lot of TF2 weapons that feature healing as a mechanic, so to narrow the discussion a bit, I'll be focusing entirely on weapons that offer healing as their primary or only use aside from doing damage. For instance, the Conqueror, Cozy Camper, and Backscratcher all feature healing as bonuses, but have additional perks that may incentivize you to use them for something more than just the health. I want to focus on weapons that feature healing as their primary mechanics for the sake of this video. All that said, let's roll. I'd say come again. And then I'd laugh because I said, come. Ah, uh, the first weapon for the video, and we're already demonetized. Off to a good start. For real though, the Mad Milk is pretty neat. Even putting aside all of our epic jabroni mic bodily fluid jokes, it's still one of the most popular and respected scout weapons in the game. Despite being a very widely used and ubiquitous weapon within scout's lineup, I can't recall a single time I've ever seen someone complain about it or posture that it's overpowered. It's a remarkably unbothered weapon, and one that I can't really take any umbrage with. It's also so hilarious. But why is that? The Mad Milk is an unlockable, throwable secondary weapon for Scout. It's a jar of a mysterious quote-unquote non-milk substance, which can be thrown at enemies, not unlike the sniper's Jurati. Upon hitting an enemy or surface, the jar explodes, splashing the mysterious contents within onto all enemies in its immediate vicinity for 10 seconds. During this time, 60% of all damage done to the sodden victims is returned to the attackers as health. So if you deal 100 damage, you'll be instantly healed for 60. After being throne, the Mad Milk will be placed on a 20 second recharge timer, which can be shortened to 16 by extinguishing a teammate with it. Enemies can only remove the mysterious non-milk substance by being healed for an extended period of time, being ubered, charging, or submerging themselves in water. Anyone milked is also afflicted with visible dripping liquid particles, and a white droplet icon is placed on their HUD to let them know that they're currently drenched. Anyone on the scout's team can take advantage of a soaked victim, making this weapon great for enabling big plays in team fights. Now, I know what we're all thinking. Boy, is that nasty. There definitely is a reason why everyone names their Mad Milk some kind of disgusting white liquid joke, but it is worth noting that this weapon's publicity blur mentions it being radioactive cow's milk and not the alternative, so at least your mind can rest at ease. Doesn't mean we're not all still gonna make jokes, though. Personally, mine is called Wind Up Tifa, because she's in there somewhere. Jokes aside, this is such a bizarrely irreverent concept for a weapon in TF2 to have, a game that already features multiple piss-based mechanics, and the intentional smoke around it really only adds to that, and I wouldn't have it any other way. It's very funny. As for its actual mechanics, the Mad Milk is one of the more uniquely designed weapons in TF2. It's one of three soaking weapons in the game, and is in my opinion, one that offers a bonus that rests comfortably between the Jurati and the Gas Passer in terms of usefulness. Being able to guarantee on-command healing to yourself and teammates is inarguably very useful, and can really help push your team to victory in team fights that may have otherwise been much tighter. 60% is a huge percentage of health to return with each shot, and it can really help you survive situations that you might not have had any chance to otherwise. Keep in mind that two max damage meat shots at the scatter gun will heal enough to fully recover your entire HP pool with this weapon. That's not to say that it's only useful as a team support tool, however, as in cases where you're being singled out by a particularly aggressive enemy, be it a 1v1 or a 1v12, tossing the Mad Milk at the beginning of a fight can really be the linchpin to your survival. Against tanky classes like Heavy and Soldier, the added self-sustain can help you stay in the fight longer and clutch out what would have assuredly been guaranteed losses without it. Plus, if you just toss it on some enemies and then piss off during a team fight, then you'll start seeing entirely unearned kill assists stack up like debts to an unusual trader. Your team will always appreciate having a group of enemies be milked in this entirely safe for work context, so liberal use of this item is encouraged. This really is a universally useful weapon that's not really a bad option to bring at any point, and is only kept from being a must pick by Scout having an incredibly stacked lineup of secondaries. On top of that, this weapon is a super effective counter to both Spy and Pyro. As a soaking throwable, it makes exposing and tracking cloak spies a breeze, and even though it doesn't short out the spy's cloak like the Jurati, 
body, it's still easier to track a bunch of floating milk droplet particles than it is an invisible spy. As for Pyro, this weapon can be used to quickly and easily extinguish yourself or teammates, which is especially huge on Scout due to his low health pool and close range fighting style, making Pyro a pretty effective kryptonite to him. Your recharge timer is reduced when using this weapon to extinguish teammates, so you should never be afraid to do it. Lastly, as a soaking throwable, you don't have to direct to enemies of the jar to make the most out of it. The splash has a 200 hammer unit radius, so just blind tossing this item in the general direction of a crowd of enemies can be more than enough to ensure some mileage. I do find its arc a bit trickier to aim than the Jurati's, but I think that's just a me problem. As always though, there are a few downsides to this weapon, and I'm not just talking about the shame that comes with filling the jar. For one, the 20 second recharge timer is kind of huge. Despite this weapon being most helpful when used liberally, you do have to exercise some degree of picky choosiness with when, how, and why you use it, as it'll be out of commission for a pretty sizable length of time after each use. If you want to use it to tough out a team fight, then you might not have it to extinguish yourself later on. If you want to extinguish yourself or a teammate, then you won't have it to provide support during your next fight. Using the Mad Milk is very committal, and it can be tricky to find the best times to use it. In addition, this weapon competes pretty heavily with some other very strong options in Scout's secondary slot. With exception to maybe the Winger, Scout doesn't really have a bad secondary, and the myriad of uses that each of them have can lead to situations where the Mad Milk simply isn't the best option. I'd say it's one of Scout's more universally useful secondaries, but there are situations where other options will flourish more. It's kind of a jack-off-of-all-trades, masturbate-of-none kind of item. Wait, what? Sometimes, having the damage of the pistols, the buffs of the sodas, or the damage over time of the cleaver will help more in taking out important targets. But even with that, the Mad Milk is all around a universally powerful scout weapon, and one of the most consistently useful utility secondaries in the game. It's a weapon that nobody would ever complain about having on their side, and I can personally say that I've never been horribly annoyed to be hit by it. It doesn't really tip the scales into being overpowered or over-centralizing, it's just kind of an overall strong and unbothered scout item that can fit snugly into pretty much any loadout. I honestly really like that about it, that a weapon with one of the most irreverent and objectionable concepts in the game is one of the least offensive in terms of its balance. You really never hear anyone complain about the Mad Mill. It's one of the most unbothered, staying in its lane type weapons in the game, and I'm honestly all here for it. Also, it's cum. Or you can trade it all in for what's in this box. The box! The box! From a relatively unbothered weapon to one of the most contentious in the game. The Black Box, our second weapon for this video, is noteworthy for facilitating one of the most contentious and widely hated playstyles in the game. It's been called a wide variety of things, from a crutch, to broken, to brain dead, to a bunch of other interchangeable negative gamer words that don't mean anything, and you'll be happy to know that I bit the bullet and earnestly used this weapon for an extended period of time for this video. And honestly, I don't really get it. Well, um, if it's any consolation, mm -hmm. I actually don't really care. Well, that's not the attitude to have. I know, well, I just figured I'd be honest with you. Let's talk, at length, about the black box. The Black Box is an unlockable rocket launcher for Soldier with one of the most simple stat lineups in the game. You know the deal though, simplicity can be deceptive, just ask Pot of Greed. The Black Box's rockets travel at the same speed and deal the same amount of damage as stock. Its primary and only positive stat is that it heals the player for up to 20 health for every successfully landed rocket, with the healing being equivalent to 1 point of health for every 4.5 points of damage, capping out at 20 healing when damaging for over 90. This makes the Black Box a super effective self sustaining weapon during 1v1s, and a clear choice for a soldier who struggles to stay alive. As a deceptively large trade-off, the Black Box loads one fewer rocket per clip than stock, allowing only three shots before needing to reload. This affects more than you would probably think, as one less rocket equates to one-fourth less damage over time, rocket jumps, shots and fights, and even healing per clip. Right off the bat, the Black Box may seem like either an incredibly strong or incredibly terrible weapon based on where your priorities lie on Soldier. The up to 20 extra health per shot can inarguably help you tough out fights that you may have otherwise crumpled in, and the fact that the healing is based on the overall damage each rocket does rather than the amount of damage it does individually to each target means that blind firing into groups of enemies can yield surprisingly large health numbers. In tougher, tricky fights, the healing provided by the Black Box can be the linchpin that you may need to pull out a clutch victory. 
it gives you passive lifesteal on a class that's inarguably one of the best damage dealers in the game. However, all of those positives are immediately and fiercely counteracted by one of the most deceptively crushing downsides in the game. The one less rocket per clip is absolutely gargantuan. It might not seem like much, but make no mistake, Soldier lives and dies by his clip, and the lengthy reload combined with the committal nature of firing a single rocket means that having any less shots can really mess up your flow. One less rocket removes one quarter of your damage output in fights, so your overall DPS is significantly lower, you have one less rocket jump for loadouts, and it even affects this weapon's playstyle defining healing. There is an argument to be made that the healing might not be that important in sustained fights, when you'd likely have been able to win either way with the additional rocket and damage. That obviously depends heavily on the overall match and game state, but it's something to consider. Because of these two factors, I generally consider the black box to be purely a side grade that's positives are directly and proportionately balanced out by its negatives. This is a weapon that rests as a pure and uncomfortable 50-50 on the bad to broken scale, with its positives and negatives counteracting each other and keeping them in check in equal measures. For such a contentious weapon, it honestly strikes me as one of the more thoughtfully balanced in the game. Its self-healing can be incredibly strong, and it's definitely frustrating to lose a fight because of that possible 20 health difference, but arguing that the one less rocket isn't a huge downside is fighting a losing battle. Back onto a general discussion of this weapon's stats, the self-healing's overall effectiveness and utility depends heavily on the situation you're applying it in. In more structured, coordinated game states or game modes, like 1v1s, MGE, or competitive, where moment-to-moment -moment damage number calculations can make huge differences, it's inarguably very strong. Up to 20 extra health is a deceptively large value in TF2, especially on Soldier, and can be just what you need to survive what would otherwise be very close battles. That said, in less coordinated environments like team fights and most of casual, I find the self-healing to matter a little bit less. Like when there's a large amount of sustained focus fire coming from all sides, 20 extra health every second or so, capping out at 60 before needing to reload, doesn't make that big of a difference. When you've got two teams of 12 bearing down on each other rather than two coordinated teams or singular players, 20 health isn't as big of a deal. It can definitely still help, but you're much more apt to be outdamaged in these environments. There are situations where the utility of the extra damage and one extra rocket may shine a bit more brightly than the personal self-healing. Back to what I said at the beginning of this section, the black box facilitates what's inarguably one of the most contentious and hated playstyles in TF2. Players view a soldier with the ability to passively heal himself as incredibly degenerate and unfun to fight against, and after giving it an extended play period for this video, all I have to say is... Everybody hates me I'm because so of you! sorry. Fenton, shut up! Alright, shut up! And you stop your weaselly little crying! NOW! Like, if you're a competitive player, an MGE player, or someone who takes damage values deathly seriously in this game, I get it. 20 extra health every shot can be a tricky thing to contend with. But in casual, where I feel like people are most apt to use this weapon, there are answers to it. Sustain focus fire and coordinated team attacks handily beat it, and even if that's not possible, the soldier will be incredibly vulnerable after firing only 3 shots. If you can pay attention and play around that, you'll be just fine. Again, I earnestly view the black box as one of the more thoughtfully designed weapons in TF2, and one that doesn't deserve anywhere near the vitriol it gets, as its positive and negative stats really do balance each other out quite well. The healing can definitely help, but there are concrete answers and counterplay to it that I feel some people willfully ignore. If you can count how many shots a soldier is firing, you can counter accordingly. It's not the most fun to fight against, but it's far from broken, degenerate, or evil. Unless the soldier is using the conqueror with it, but that's a story for another day. Some people fuck at funerals. I cut off heads. On to our third weapon, the Half Zatoichi. This is actually the first Demo Man weapon we're discussing in the weapon subcategory series, and I know what you might be thinking. Isn't this weapon also usable on Soldier? And all I have to say to that is, it sure is, son. It sure is. Nah, for real though, the Half Zatoichi is technically a multi-class weapon, but it's very transparently designed to be used primarily on Demo Knight, and is pretty much just a gimmicky novelty on Soldier. For the purposes of this video, we'll be discussing it mostly as a Demo Knight weapon. That said, onto its stats. 
the half Zatoichi is an unlockable sword melee weapon for Demo Man and Soldier. Just like Demo Man's other swords, it features a 75% slower switch speed and a 50% larger melee range compared to his other weapons, making it Soldier's only weapon with a switch speed penalty and one of only two he has with a longer range. As for its unique traits, it instantly heals the player for 50% of their maximum HP on kill, with the HP restored being proportional to the player's max HP at the time they get the kill. For example, a stock soldier heals 100, whereas a battalion soldier heals 110. In addition, this weapon features a unique dual mechanic, where players wielding it can instantly kill each other with a single melee swing. As a primary trade-off, this weapon is quote-unquote honor-bound, requiring either a kill or a 50 health penalty to switch after deploying it. If you're below 50 HP and haven't gotten a kill, it can't be holstered at all. This makes it incredibly committal on Soldier and Hybrid Knight, yet basically downside free on Demo Knight. So, like I said, this weapon is pretty much nothing more than a gimmicky novelty on regular Demo Man and especially Soldier. Neither of them are melee combat oriented or fast enough to comfortably close the distance on enemies and secure the kill required to holster it, and the honor bound mechanic combined with its slower switch speed takes away their ability to combo it effectively with other weapons to secure kills. Unlike something like the Market Gardener, a Soldier can't safely rocket jump in and quickly rocket jump out to escape should he fail to kill someone. The sword wide lack of random critical hit means you'll always have to land at least two swings to kill a full health target, and the 50% max health heal can't really offset how committal and unsafe this weapon is in the hands of an ordinary gun-wielding soldier. It can definitely be fun to whip out as a surprise mix-up, but there's not much practicality to it beyond that. That's not to say that it's all bad, though. You may have noticed that I said regular Demo Man and Hybrid Knight a bit ago, and the reason for that is because this is an incredibly strong, pure Demo Knight weapon. From my experience, this is the only sword that can really consistently rival the Islander as the best and most consistent Demo Knight melee on offer. On a subclass that does not need to switch weapons, is fast and tanky by default, and has access to an on-command burst movement option that also grants damage, pretty much all of its downsides disappear. It doesn't have the negative base of the Islander, the increased self-damage of the Claydemore, or the redundancy of the Persian Persuader. On Demo Knight, this is a purely and wholly beneficial weapon, with no downsides outside of not offering the other sword's positives. To put it simply, you can survive some absolutely wacky shit with this thing. You can get away with kills and rolls that a purely melee-oriented subclass in a gun-based FPS simply should not be able to. Being able to dart from enemy to enemy, rack up kill after kill, healing, potentially overhealing with each target taken down, and getting out when the going gets rough thanks to your constantly refilling health brings a level of satisfaction that is unparalleled in TF2. With the Demo Knight boots, you'll be healing 100 health with each kill, and if you know to prioritize squishy targets who can and efficiently defend themselves at point blank range, you can easily outheal your enemy's damage in a very comfortable fashion. If you ever find yourself one swing away from a target and are getting low on health personally, just keep on swinging. If you land that kill, you'll be in tip top shape again and can continue your roll in no time. This weapon is simply unrivaled in terms of the endurance and sustainability it grants Demo Knight. Even though it lacks the Islander's increased health and movement speed on kill, it can single handedly facilitate an incredibly aggressive tanking Demo Knight playstyle that may just be more beneficial than the Islander depending on the map, game state, and enemy team composition. If you combo it with the Tide Turner, which grants you seamless turning and refills most of your charge meter on kill, you can basically become a murderous ping pong ball that bounces between enemies like a stone teenager looking for a store that stocks Funyuns. It's very fun. All in all, the Half Zatoichi is an incredibly fun, damn near overpowered weapon when used on Demo Knight, with an effective complete lack of downsides and a purely beneficial line of stats. When used on traditional classes though, it's pretty much the exact opposite, and only really serves as a gimmicky mix-up tool that crumples once enemies know you have it. It's an incredibly black and white design that's effectiveness hinges entirely on what context you are using it in. I know that this section was comparatively short within the weapon subcategory series, but this really is a very simple and very effective weapon. If you're fiercely married to the Islander as your primary Demo Knight sword, I'd strongly recommend giving the half Zatoichi a try and go on some honor bound duels. I promise you, you'll cause more death than dishonor. The best daddy can! Also, he's a ninja.
Without a doubt, the most controversial thing I've done since returning full-time to the TF2 sphere was in the first episode of the Weapon Subcategory series. In the skill-dependent weapons video, I made the bold and controversial decision to include the Conniver's Kunai for Spy within the list of items for the video. Some people did not like this, as the Kunai is pretty widely considered to be one of the most powerful and over-centralizing unlocks in the game, and my claim that it was at all skill-intensive did not sit well with some people. So now that we're a bit away from that, has my opinion on the kunai changed? No! No, man! No, man! No! I don't think so! I don't think so! Can you guys tell I've been watching home movies recently? Look, I'll concede that this weapon is very strong, but I also thoroughly believe that it's not a weapon for every situation, or an entirely over-centralizing best-in-slot pick. Let's dive into its stats. The Conniver's Kunai is an unlockable knife for Spy. It boasts the unique trait of making the Spy start out each life with 55 less HP, for a maximum of 70, or the lowest base health possible for any class under the game's normal rules. This makes the Spy susceptible to one-shots from virtually every form of burst damage in the game. As a primary positive, it gives the Spy's backstabs a very potent lifesteal effect, with him sapping up to 210 HP of overheal with each stab. This brings the Spy from being the frailest class in the game to the second tankiest. Getting a stab also cleanses the Spy of all negative damage dealing debuffs like fire and bleed. Already, this should immediately strike you as a weapon that exists only in extremes. Fresh out of spawn, a spy wielding this weapon is walking around as the single frailest and weakest player-controlled force in the game. The amount of things that can comfortably one-shot you is pretty staggering. For reference, here's a full list of every weapon in the game that can one-shot you while using this weapon without a crit, which cannot one-shot you with another knife. Every scout primary, every soldier primary, every shotgun except the rescue ranger, every grenade launcher, every damaging sticky bomb launcher, the scotsman skull cutter, the warrior spirit, a long range crusader's crossbow bolt, the shot and shot, and for good measure, the enforcer if the spy is disguised. To put it simply, a spy using the kunai begives each life at an objective, clear, and massive disadvantage. The vast majority of damage dealing weapons in the game can comfortably kill him in a matter of moments. Now, to be completely fair and honest, this shouldn't matter too much in the case of Spy specifically. Spy is a class designed to sneak around and deceive the enemy team, and isn't likely to spend too much time engaging in close-range gunfights and not going for backstabs. At pretty much every moment of the average Spy player's game plan, they're going to be actively pursuing their next stab. On top of that, Spy does have access to the Dead Ringer, which is explicitly designed to help him survive and skirt what would otherwise be sure death scenarios. Being so frail as Spy does not matter matter as much as it would on other classes. That said, it's still inarguably a massive downside, and one that cannot be ignored. If you're caught out without your dead ringer, you're dead. That aside, this weapon's primary positive is also, inarguably, very, very strong. As I said, a spy doing their job will likely be actively fishing for their next stab at every possible moment, and being rewarded for landing one with a 210 health overheal is definitely incredibly generous. After landing a single stab, you're potentially rocking more health than a soldier, and still have the ability to secure more stabs, your cloak, and the ability to either go for a roll or safely escape to fall back on. Spy as a class has the tools to adeptly capitalize on a buff like this, so fishing for a stab when you're at low health or being actively pursued by an enemy can be the perfect get-out-of-jail free card. This is one of the more controversial things about the kunai, its potential to enable spies to survive sure-death scenarios by stealing a cheeky stab off of a wayward, out-of-position teammate. I'll admit, it can be frustrating to chase a spy on a death's door, only to have him escape by backstabbing a gibbous soldier and suddenly being perfectly healthy again. On top of that, the kunai can absolutely facilitate some insane rolls and chain stabs. Not unlike what I said about the half Zatoichi a bit ago, you can survive some pretty gnarly shit with this thing. However, is that really a bad thing? Like, it's a knife designed to make Spy the weakest class in the game, but give him lifesteal on kill. It exists purely in extremes, and then we get mad at it for doing what it's designed for? I don't know, it seems a bit strange to me. Why is it balanced for a Demo Knight with the half Zatoichi to do literally the exact same thing on a tankier and more mobile class, but this is considered unacceptable? 
Aside from that, this is a knife that prioritizes a careful balancing act between conservative and hyper aggro play. You have to be patient, safe, and picky enough with your engagements to not immediately be caught out and killed, yet aggressive and active enough to secure stabs and take advantage of the health buff. This is a knife that could potentially come off as incredibly counterintuitive, but in reality, it mandates thoughtful attacks of opportunity more than any other knife except the Your Eternal Reward. If you play too passively, then you might as well not be using this knife, yet if you play too carelessly, you'll likely be dying more than you'll be stabbing. And this is ultimately why I don't view the Conniver's Kunai as an overpowered, brain-dead, or broken weapon. It is most certainly strong, and can facilitate some insane plays, but it's also a weapon that requires that you play it, rather than playing Spy. Using the Kunai is effectively a sub-playstyle in and of itself, and requires playing Spy in a very specific, half-passive, half-aggressive way to get the most out of it. It is not a knife for every situation or game state, which separates it from other best-in-slot picks like the Sandwich or Crusader's Crossbow. I will absolutely concede that this weapon is incredibly strong and potentially anti-fun to fight against, but I have trouble viewing it with the outward vitriol that a lot of other people tend to. It's a strong, rewarding weapon, but one that ultimately does not reward every playstyle. Also, he's a ninja. I hope you're prepared for an unforgettable engine. Yeah. And for the last section of this video, let's do something a little wacky. Let's talk about an entire weapon subcategory rather than an item within it. This is a section about Heavy's lunchbox items. These things need no introduction. They're some of the most ubiquitous, widely known, and often used weapons in TF2. If you ask the average person who's only familiar with TF2 through Gmod and SFM to name 10 things about the game, the fat guy with the sandwich would probably not be too far down the list. These items are a core part of tf 2 identity. Let's talk about why. Heavy has three healing lunchbox items in the game, and they all work as follows. They're all secondary weapons, which replace the heavy shotguns, are all food, and all share a few traits. They all require a taunt to use, at which point the heavy will spend roughly 4.3 seconds eating them, while releasing a very funny voice clip. Afterwards, they'll all be placed on a cooldown timer. Where they differ is in their individual effects. The sandwich heals heavy fully over its eating duration, healing for 300 health, and then being placed on a 30 second cooldown. It can be thrown to teammates to act as a medium health kit. The Delacus Bar heals Heavy for 100 health, but grants him 50 additional max health on top of that for 30 seconds. It can be thrown to teammates to act as a small health pack and takes 10 seconds to recharge. The Second Banana heals the Heavy for 200 health over its duration, and shares both its recharge timer and health pack size with the Delacus Bar. All three have their recharge timer instantly refilled upon picking up any size health pack, and all drop as healing items for enemies if they're killed while in the Heavy's hands. So, unlike every other weapon in this video, which all featured a lifesteal or heal-on-kill effect, the lunchbox items are purely support and sustain-oriented healing items that cannot deal damage to enemies. It doesn't take much detective work to figure out why items like this would be a perfect fit for Heavy. He's a slow, damage-soaking tank that's designed to be an anchor for his team, giving him the capability of on-command self-sustain or the ability to directly burst heal his teammates is a no-brainer that helps him be less reliant on health packs and medic support. Heavy does doesn't really need his shotgun, and these weapons are what enable him to be played as a standalone class, which is vitally important. The lunchbox items are obviously a very good fit for TF2, and something that the game would objectively be way worse without. The new opportunities they open up for Heavy, the combination of self and team support, the fact that they basically single-handedly make Heavy playable as a class, their overall iconography and importance to the game's branding, it's hard to imagine TF2 without Heavy's lunchbox items. That said, let's dive into each of them individually. The Sandwich was Heavy's first lunchbox items, and definitely one of the big two. It boasts the highest raw numbers out of the three, and is the most useful to a Heavy who's anchoring his team and playing around a medic. The 300 on-command health is incredibly useful for topping yourself off after a fight or between enemies, and being able to instantly grant any teammate who needs it the equivalent to a medium health pack is inarguably a massive benefit, especially for, or even in the lack of, a medic. Its only real problem is the 30 second recharge timer, which is definitely huge, and can lead to situations where you'll have to choose between your own survival and helping nearby teammates. All things said though, you really can't go wrong with the sandwich. It's the Smash Bros. Mario of lunchbox items, an all-arounder that's good in most situations. 
The Delacus Bar is Heavy's second lunchbox item, and probably the weakest out of the three that heal. It only heals 100 health on a 10 second recharge timer, and the bonus of 50 extra max health kind of crumbles in the face of a medic due to its boost not stacking with and overall failing to an overheal. Plus, 50 extra max health won't really mean much outside of 1v1s with other heavies and sentries, and while it definitely can be a linchpin that decides your victory, the situations where it flawlessly lines up and saves your entire team will likely be few and far between. This is an item that flourishes best on a solo heavy going into a big battle, but isn't too worth considering aside from that. I know some people swear by it, but I'll give it a generous not for me. And Heavy's last healing lunchbox item, and the other side of the big two, is the second banana, also known by the much better name of the battle banana. This was introduced in the game as a joke consolation prize for Heavy losing the meat versus match contest, which is funny because it's better than every weapon that Pyro got out of winning that contest. This is basically Sandwich Light, and operates as a great support tool for a solo flanking Heavy. It heals 200 health with a 10 second recharge, and due to the recharge timer starting during the eating animation, the actual time between bananas is closer to 5 seconds. This allows it to handily outheal a sandwich in terms of prolonged healing over time, and is a no-brainer for a heavy operating without a medic. As a trade-off, its in-the-moment healing is lower, and it's significantly worse for a team play oriented heavy, as the noticeably worse burst healing it provides to teammates and especially medics makes it less viable for team support overall. It's definitely still strong, but also a bit selfish compared to the sandwich. All of these food items have unique concrete niches within Heavy's kit, with the Sandwich being best for a team player Anchor Heavy, the Delacos Bar being the best for a solo Anchor Heavy, and the Battle Banana being the best for a solo Flanking Heavy. They cover each other's weaknesses in such concrete ways, and encourage switching to and from them so consistently that it's hard to pick just one. These are all around some of my favorite weapons in the game, and are a big part of why Heavy is my favorite class. They're such brilliantly, thoughtfully designed weapons, and ones that are as core to my perspective exception of TF2 as rocket jumps, medigums, and the color orange. I cannot imagine this game without them. They are key staple TF2 items, and should be some of the first things you consider when thinking about the game. They turn heavy into a viable class, they're funny as hell, and they're delicious. What's not to like? Get the hell out of here, Buffalo Steak. So, where does that leave us on TF2's self-healing weapons? Well, I have two observations to make about them. One is that with exception to the Mad Milk and the Sandwich, these tend to be very contentious. Players generally don't like it when they shoot at enemies and they don't die in the amount of shots or damage that they perceive they should. If they have a medic following them, then there is a clear and concentrated reason why that's happening, and a target for them to focus on. They need to shoot the medic. However, in the case of something like the Black Box, the Half Satoichi, or the Kunai, a player might not immediately realize or care that the enemy they're fighting is using a weapon that heals them, and will just get frustrated that they're not dying. Personally, I think this speaks to a larger perception problem and people not being willing to counterplay around certain weapons, but it is worth noting that some of these weapons are not very well liked. Aside from that, something else I noticed is that, once again, with exception to the Mad Milk and the Sandwich, most of these weapons don't tend to compensate or make up for the lack of a medic on a team. Be it for the Black Box's lackluster healing and overall lower damage, the half Zatoichi taking away the Demo Man's primary and secondary weapon and just being not that worth using on Soldier, and the Kunai starting you out at a significantly worse base, these weapons really do flourish the best alongside a Medic, rather than as a replacement or substitution for one. Medic is the most important class in TF2, and no matter how much you want to deny it or how much you want to try to replace him with fancy toys or peripherals, you just won't be able to do without that Medic companionship. Regardless, thanks, hope you have a fantastic day before, during, and after watching, and I'll catch you all later. Cheers!